All righty, we are ready to welcome up our next panel. Um, we have joining us Catherine Hollifield, who's the program manager of the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, and Chase Sova, who's senior director of public policy and research at the World Food Program. Thanks to you both for joining us. Those should be on. It's great to get the chance to be here today and to speak after such a great, um, stimulating, exciting presentation already. Yeah, I think we're going to dive in a little bit more on the, the financing stuff for sure. Um, so thanks to you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, we, we wanted to, on this panel, talk a little bit about kind of both ends um, of financial investment in food systems. So WFP, obviously very focused on the emergency side, emergency humanitarian response. Um, GAF-SP, much more medium to long-term building resilience. Um, and so I'd love to start with you, Catherine. Um, you, uh, we're getting you here the day before you're having a steering committee meeting for GAF-SP, so really timely. Um, would love to hear what's at the top of your list right now. What are you gonna be discussing in that meeting? Um, you know, what are people's concerns in this moment? Okay, that's, that's a great question. Something certainly very much on our minds. Um, our steering committee, just let me share that we have a very inclusive steering committee. We have representatives from the countries themselves, our partner countries. We have representatives from civil society. We have the donors at the table and we have our partner implementing agencies, which includes World Food Program, among others. Um, the purpose of our meeting this week um, is to really look at what's happening in the world through the eyes of the different seats around the table, the different people sitting around the table. What is it that the countries are experiencing? What is it that they see as the solutions? How are they building those solutions? And what do they want in terms of support and from whom? Those are the sort of the first group of uh, questions that we're asking and looking to hear on. The second group is really looking at our implementing agencies. And our implementing agencies are the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, et cetera, and the, the Rome-based food and agriculture institutions and agencies. What is it that those programs are doing? How are they pulling together their own resources and their own programs to respond? And then that's where GAF-SP comes in. GAF-SP really is meant as a complement to the humanitarian and short-term development response. And it's all about this longer-term question of looking at the medium to long-term sustainability of the system. So how can we at this, this moment, when the financing is so critical on the humanitarian side, try to keep a bit of a balance to ensure that when we get into this kind of situation in the coming months or the coming years, which we will, I mean, we've gone through COVID, we've gone through and we've been watching everything that's happening with the stresses from climate change that's, that's there all the time, essentially. We've got the drought in the Horn of Africa. We've got conflict in many of the, the world's poorest countries, Afghanistan, Myanmar. We see what's happening in the Sahel. All of these, as we've heard and you mentioned, they're all waves of shock. So we have to complement what's happening in terms of the quick and necessary and and just tragic response on the humanitarian side with trying to find a way to make sure that as um, Lawrence Haddad said earlier, building back, building forward better. And that's what GAF-SP is trying to, to help support. So to me, this is where this partnership with World Food Program and our other implementing agencies is so critical. Yeah, that's a that's a really good scene setter. And I think it touches on what what Ertherin was saying, too, about how we always struggle to have that that longer term view. So it's good that we have an organization that was specifically created to be doing that. <laughs> There's a lot on your shoulders. Um, Chase, I want to come to you now and talk a little bit more about that emergency side. We, of course, heard a little bit from Ertherin on that as well. Um, but we've all heard David Beasley out there. Um, I might say begging for money, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, when it comes to funding. Um, you know, how are you all thinking about the funding that you have right now, responding to yet another crisis when you were already forced to be cutting rations in places like Yemen and just really couldn't afford another crisis? Right. Well, you know, I'm from Wisconsin, so I don't have nearly as thick of the Southern accent or the persuasive powers maybe that David <laughs> Beasley has, but I'm going to do my best up here to, to uh, present in his absence. Um, you know, Raj, I think at the start of the, the sort of opening comments you mentioned, it's sort of a break the glass kind of moment. Um, and I think it is kind of an obligation and a duty of mine to make sure that we are, uh, that I'm pulling as many alarms as I could possibly get my hands on. Um, 
there have been over the last couple of months a lot of references to the Second World War when it comes to global food security. You know, in the Second World War, we lost 50 million people. And by some estimates, pretty conservative estimates, maybe between 10 and 15 million people uh, in that war died of hunger and hunger-related diseases. Right? This was a mass starvation event on a scale that we haven't really ever seen. So those parallels are, are powerful and, and to a certain extent accurate today. If you look around the world uh, prior to the Ukrainian crisis, we had 44 million people in 38 different countries who were on the verge of famine. Right, right now, there's at least four countries who are suffering from pockets of famine. Go to northeast uh, uh, Ethiopia or northern Ethiopia right now in, in the Tigray region, and you're seeing hundreds of thousands of people in that really terrible IPC5 catastrophe famine classification. Um, so the other day, I, I called up a colleague of mine, a 30, 40 year veteran of the World Food Program, and I said, Hey, I'm seeing all these incredible numbers. I've been with the organization for five or six years now. Help me make sense of this. I mean, is this as, as bad as I, as I think it is? And this person responded to me and said, well, listen, you know, when I was sort of, quote, growing up in the World Food Program, we would be responding to two, maybe three corporate-wide emergencies at a given time, right? Those are emergencies that are so big that you've got to draw in resources from regional offices, from other country offices, headquarters, and you've got to bring them where they matter most. And this person said to me, well, I think we're probably looking, you know, if, I, if the math is right, it's probably more than 20 or 25 L3 equivalent emergencies at the World Food Program right now. Wow. <laughs> now, um, they don't use that classification anymore. It's a little bit different, but that gives you a sense of where this person's head was at. Um, when Ukraine, they also said something else to me that I want to transmit to you. One was that, you know, when you get in a situation like that where the needs are so great and the resourcing is so inadequate to the problem, WFP becomes an organization that exists to move food from hungry people to starving people, right? And that's not a very enviable position to be in, frankly. So we've been doing our back of the envelope math and, and early assessments of what's happening in Ukraine. And the best I can tell from uh, our economists and our vulnerability analysis mapping unit in Rome is that we're looking at about 47 million people being thrown into acute hunger because of the crisis, if it continues for the next couple of months in Ukraine by the end of this year. That's a huge number of people. It's going to bring the total up to 323 million. I've been thinking over the last couple of days as we're kind of prepping for this conversation, and I think 2019 is actually a pretty good reference point. If you go back to 2019, it was already a pretty tough year in terms of global hunger. We had 150 million people who were in that top classification. Um, when COVID hit, it went up to 272 million. We were trending up again to 283 last year. And now with this little bump to 325. So I was hoping that this year would be a year of good news, one of you know the economy returning to normal, returning to normal, people getting back to work, and hunger numbers sort of trending back in the direction that that we're looking for. But that just isn't the case. So when the numbers grow that big in terms of that acute hunger and the, the number of people who don't know where their next meal is going to come from, the World Food Program's budget necessarily grows commensurately. This year, WFP's budget is $20 billion. That's what we're looking for to reach the 140 odd million people that we're trying to reach this year. Um, the, just to give you a sense, back to that 2019 reference, in 2019, we were looking for $9.8 billion for the entire year. The deficit this year, the expected deficit of $10 billion is bigger than our entire operating budget was just three years prior. So it is a, it is a huge, enormous problem that we're trying to tackle. Um, and we can talk about whether the financing is up for the task, up to the task right now. I mean, I can tell you that it really isn't. What's happening is that WFP operations, this is a huge organization, right? So 20,000 people, 5,000 trucks, a couple 20, 30 ships and, and a bunch of aircraft moving food from where it, need, where it is to where it needs to be. Our budgets, because of food, fuel and shipping, our annual, our, our monthly budgets are up about $70 million. So if you extrapolate that across the whole year, we are going to be looking to spend about a billion dollars more this year than we did last year just to get back to neutral because of increased costs. Those numbers are almost so big that they don't even compute. Like you can't even really understand what that means because it's so much money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, the, and uh, like, I'm sure we'll get into this, but I mean, I think it is important to, to note. I mean, the U.S. government is very generous, right? The U.S. government provides 40 percent of the World Food Program's budget in a given year. It's a huge amount of financing. We are very grateful for what Congress and others are providing right now. Um, but frankly, we're almost an order of magnitude off from the scale of need. 
know, this isn't a problem that you're going to solve with a couple hundred million dollars. This is a this is a multi-billion dollar problem just on the humanitarian food assistance front. Mm -hmm. So now we're in this situation where it isn't just taking food from the hungry and feeding to the starving. It puts WFP and organizations like ours, other implementing partners, into a situation where they're now just choosing who lives and who dies, which is an entirely impossible position to put somebody in, but that, you know, increasingly those 20,000 staff at the World Food Program are making those choices day in and day out. That's why you're seeing David Beasley uh, getting in front of every news camera that he possibly can to, to tell that story. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, the numbers are just so astronomical that it's it's just hard to wrap your brain around. Um, GathSP was created out of the last world food price crisis. That's why the organization exists. Um, what lessons do you think we have learned from that time that GAFSP is attempting to remedy? And how close do you feel you are to having the tools that you need to really be doing that? It's a, a huge call to, to ask. And I think uh, kind of keeping in mind what we just heard from this cousin as well is that um, I think we have learned lessons. I don't think we're necessarily all that good at trying to figure out how to address and to kind of live true to the lessons that we're learning. But I, I will mention three of them that I think have been critical and have been very important in terms of how GAFSP operates. The first lesson from, uh, for, that we've seen is that it really is the countries themselves that need to be at the center of the analysis, the center of the design and the center of identifying the kind of opportunities that they want to follow up on to really move forward and make big changes. They're the ones that are that are directly experiencing the impacts of the price increases. They're the ones that have lived the experiences in terms of what happens on the climate side with how the land changes, what can be produced in the, on the land. They're the ones that, that really know what they need to actually change how they produce or how they respond to a crisis. So for us, one of the critical things is really making sure that we are connecting and, it, and it's not just with the, the, the governments and the decision makers, it really is back to the point that's also been raised about the rural communities, the farmers in those communities, they're the ones, I mean, they're the ones that are even the best stewards of the land as well. They're the ones whose families, lifestyle, their livelihoods, and their legacies to their children depend on the quality of the resources that they pass along. So actually starting from that point and giving them the opportunity, but also supporting them as they design their own strategies and approaches. The UN Food um, Foods food security summit laid out the new pathways that are being designed and trying to look at from that case. And this is, you know, critical to try and see how you, how you can actually build and move from that. That is the starting point. I think the second point relates to that and is again about the smallholders that, that are right on the ground, actually going to them and giving them the kind of support that they need more directly. And that's one thing GAFSP, when it was originally set up, gave grants to governments. Um, what happened, over time was that the recognition that, you know, the smallholders may be the missing middle is what we called it, where they're the ones that really do provide solutions on the ground so that we've been piloting for about five years and have recently scaled up so that, that the smallholders and the producers organizations that represent them get direct access to financing, to funding, to grants, so that they can develop their own capacities to serve a strong economic agents and that they can actually move forward and be part of the solutions. And in fact, um, the experience under COVID-19 was pretty telling with some of the ones that we worked with. We had um, we have a project that's still active in Bangladesh where the producer organizations very quickly recognized that they needed to find a way to shorten the value chain. They needed to get closer to the consumers and to be able to really get across and get across. So what they did was they set up call centers in about 57 of their communities, which actually helped um, reduce the spoilage of food so that more food is available and they could directly connect and get a stronger system sis, signal from consumers. So it was one of those solutions that was critical in a crisis, but it's an incredibly efficient way to rebuild a system so that you, ha you have more food at the end of the day from the same amount of effort and resources. So that's essentially my second message is really work closely with the smallholders themselves. The third message is collaboration. And here's where um, working with development partners, the supervising agencies, having them all come together 
and really at the country level, listen to what the countries are saying and enable them to look across the different projects and programs that are in place and actually having those supervising entities. We've got projects that are co-financed by all of the Rome-based agencies. So the FAO, International Fund for Agriculture Development and World Food Pro Program actually come together under GAF-SP and help solve some of the problems along the way. And they have the same kind of partnerships with the, the regional development banks as well. Definitely making the resources go farther by leveraging what their own programs do, but also having them work together so that there is a more consistent and strong signal and that that responds to what the countries are telling them, I think is, is the third very important lesson. Of course, it's incredibly difficult in a time of crisis because everybody is so busy following up and trying to do what they can do that having everyone's that panicking outrage, well and yeah. not just panicking but panicking and focusing and delivering sometimes it takes a bit of a step back to kind of look across and say okay i can be more efficient if i work with my neighbor and if i can work with the the agency across the street together we have that package of tools that can really respond to the situation and that's where the kind of partnerships with world food program where world food program is actually doing the humanitarian into development, but then from development into the longer term building of the system, you know, unleashing some of the climate funds sometimes as well, mm -hmm. so that those resources then leverage better production, even in a crisis, which continues um, beyond that. Those are the lessons that I think we're learning, but we still have a long way to go to really implement them. And of course, you can leverage the relationships that organizations like WFP already have with all of those countries, obviously a massive presence around the world. would love to hear from you, Chase, a little bit about that partnership side and sort of how you at WFP think about working with organizations like FSP or others that, um, you know, have the same long-term goals, but maybe you all have different sort of specializations within the whole system. Right. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I, when I first joined the World Food Program, I went to a board meeting in Rome. Um, and I remember Earthrin being there commenting to the board members, uh, the 36 members that made up the board at that point. And she said, we cannot afford to save the same life year in and year out. And I thought that was a really impactful thing. And it stuck with me ever since then, in fact. In fact, it's quite an honor to be up here after Earthrin, uh, who kind of motivated my career in this space in a lot of ways. Um, there are so many uh, spaces where we can be improving the way that we deliver humanitarian assistance towards those sort of development outcomes. And I think the relationship that my colleagues at WFP have with GAF-SP is a really good example of that. But I think that there's also just some bigger trends that I think we need to grab a hold of and take better advantage of, right? Um, the biggest being social protection. And this is, a, this is a space where, you know, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the U.S. government quickly inject $5 trillion into its, its domestic economy. Some of that came in the form of SNAP and WIC, and some of it came in the form of direct payments or the PPE loans, all of that stuff. That was a huge injection in the safety net. Yet when you looked around the world, there was only a very small percentage of, of countries capable of injecting those sorts of resources, and even fewer who had functioning social protection uh, and beneficiary transfer systems. And so this was um, a really, really big moment. And I think like two out of every three kids around the planet are not living under any sort of functioning safety net. So one of the really interesting outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic has been that the World Food Program was approached by no less than 40 different countries and said, hey, we need help standing these systems up, wow. right? Um, and honestly, that's quite a it's quite a light lift from uh, you know from a dollar and funding standpoint. It's a technical assistance, it's knowledge transfer, it's getting the right professionals in the room and the right technical folks in the room to be able to to give time more than anything else. Um, so that I think is a really interesting step forward. What is also happening in the humanitarian system that we talked about is this increase in the rise of cash based transfers. Um, and the, the benefit of cash and voucher programs, we still need commodities to all my folks in the agriculture producer community. We love you. We still need commodities. That's really important to the work that we do. But the cash-based assistance is doing something else. Where are you providing EBTs? Where are you providing cash? You're leaving behind this sort of infrastructure of financial inclusivity. You're allowing shopkeepers to take electronic payments all of a sudden that will endure when you leave. All of these things are really important. 
It also helps us when we work with a beneficiary or somebody, we, we find somebody in a, a forgotten part of the Sahel who has no physical identification. If those people can be enrolled in cash transfer programs, voucher programs, and you liaise with governments to get them on the dockets, all of a sudden they are, they are now uh, available to access other government programs and even the right to vote and all these really Im important things. So I think on the the sort of social safety net and social protection stuff, this is where I think we can be doing a lot more. And this is where USDA can be doing a lot more too. There are authorities in the last farm bill that give USDA the ability to do some of this tech transfer for safety net development. And we wanna see that exploited just a little bit more. The, the other thing I would say, um, you know, as it relates to GAFSP and other programs is that, you know, WFP also does a lot of what we call food assistance for asset programming. You know, here in the United States in the aftermath of the of the Great Depression, we saw programs like the Works Progress Administration, the Civ Civilian Conservation Corps that was putting people to work, especially young people to work, young men especially. And that was those are really important programs and things that WFP is trying to replicate in, in places around the world with these food assistance for asset programs. Imagine providing people with assistance or cash uh, in exchange for their participation in community development projects and asset building projects bridges, ponds, dams, feeder roads to get into markets. We're developing and rehabilitating thousands of acres of land every year through these. And I think the probably the best example, if you look at it, is, is the Sahel. There's a program called the Integrated Resilience Program in the Sahel. WFP and partners are working with five different countries there. In the places where that sort of asset work is being done and combined with school feeding and nutrition programming, you're seeing a, a greening of the desert. We can turn these places around you're seeing reduced conflict between pastoralists and agricultural communities, and you're seeing an increase in social cohesion in those places. So that sort of resilience work, that model, I think is growing more and more important in WP's eyes. And again, to Earthworth's point, uh, not saving the same life year in and year out. The WFP in corporate speak, this is the saving lives and changing lives, but it's a lot more than that. And it sounds to me too, you're talking more about interconnecting the humanitarian and the development side and not necessarily only having a humanitarian response to a crisis, but thinking about the development work that's as well. That's right. That's right. And well, that's the way the government's programmed their dollars anyway. I mean, you look at USAID and they do a pretty good job of figuring out ways to stack and layer programs so that when WFP leaves, and, and it's our hope that we do, uh, for somebody else to come in with a, a medium and longer term resilience and, and development program. That's just the way that those things are designed. I guess the point is, is WFP can be leveraged more given the fact that we have this enormous footprint and operating 80 different countries with the staffing that we do in those places and so many thousands of local partners who help with food distribution and work with communities and school feeding programs. Um, I think it's under leveraged and I won't speak for WFP in that, but I think they're under leveraged when it comes to helping transition from humanitarian to development work. Catherine, I'd love to hear your perspective on that and sort of, you know, thinking about GAFSP's role in the, you know, thinking medium to long term. How do you think about the connection between humanitarian and development work and, you know, where might that bridge need to be made a little bit more solid so that the development work in, in the end can be more successful and we don't need a humanitarian response? I would like to pick up on that point in terms of what you mentioned on the ground and the point that we heard earlier from one of the speakers, I think it, it was our colleague from USAID and the, the pre-recorded, talking about the critical importance of diversifying production and diversifying sourcing as well and diversify, diversifying from a crop perspective but a geographic perspective as well. And certainly the, when you, you look at the issues related to migration as well, um, actually finding ways to support production in the regions, in the countries and in the communities that are actually impacted so that you're, you're not having to rely on production from so predominantly from some countries around the world and to try and help support the development of those communities. And we all know that agriculture in rural spaces is, is a economic activity, but it's also very much part of the fabric of the community. It's a cultural activity as well. And an so, identity. Exactly. So it's, uh, it is it is a whole system from so many different perspectives and actually supporting and seeing how the local actors can actually be part of the humanitarian solution. I mean, we saw that in a sense, in a different way, I guess, under COVID, where you had communities that were actually the, the 
making the PPE that was required. They were the ones that stepped up. They were the ones from in countries that would um, immediately support the creation of household farms, backyard farms, where people were starting to produce on site. They're the ones that were connecting and identifying who are the vulnerable that weren't getting access to food, which is part of the crisis response. But the, that's the exact kind of community and local response that will make the community more resilient in the future as well. So I don't find, and I find it very difficult, um, it's not helpful to try and figure out where humanitarian to development, to emergency development, to long-term development, it is... It's a, some kind of a continuum, but there aren't breaks between it. It's not one or the other. You really can look at how you do your humanitarian in a way that's building systems, which is what World Food Program is doing. And from the GAF-SP side of things and from the perspective of the, the multilateral development banks, really looking at it in a way that you build agriculture, you respond in a way that builds the resilience of the system and helps avoid those immediate crises. And that's, you know, that's the core of what GAF-SP does. And to, just to be really clear about GAF-SP, it's a financing platform. So the collaboration is not only on the side of the supervising entity supporting the countries, but it's also on the donor side of things as well, where donors contribute to GAF-SP, recognizing that they're not the ones that decide where the money goes or which country gets the support. It's the countries themselves that de decide who they want to work with, which supervising entity, and they compete for the resources. Where will they be used the most effectively? So I find that the, the direct support is really helpful, and I'm, I'm pretty new to GAF-SP after several months. One of the things that I find really useful is that we meet regularly with our steering committee. We're talking about big issues like COVID-19, like the crisis that we're having right now. And we're told that we actually help facilitate stronger exchanges and really reinforce that need for collaboration at the country level so that people that are really trying to get their job done remember that they've got to call their colleague across the street from World Food Program to say, okay, you're doing something similar. How can we make it work better? That's also a critical part. So I guess I'm breaking down a little bit. It's not one or the other. And it's, it's, it's the same as when you look at agriculture and climate and climate change and climate resilience. You can't have agriculture without solid resources. You know that climate is actually undermining them. So if you're really going to do sustainable agriculture for the future, you've got to protect the resource base. Everything you do has to, has to actually take that into account. So that's another kind of, it's not an either or. You really just have to do both. And I think that was one of the messages out of the UN Food System Summit as well, right? One of the main goals of that entire endeavor was to make everyone see all of those connections that perhaps had been denied for so long. Um, you know, I talked to some climate folks that were intimately involved with that and, you know, said, I, I never really thought about the food system in this way, right? And as well as, you know, nutrition people, Lauren Sadad said to me, you know, he led one of the action tracks. I've never talked to so many climate people in my life. It just wasn't something that that he was doing. It wasn't something that we were forced to be doing before that whole endeavor. And I think you're right that all of those connections and, and partnerships are, are really important. Um, one additional question for you thinking about your steering committee meeting this week, um, you know, Chase laid out all of the, you know, just massive need on the humanitarian side and the budget shortfall um, from donors when we're thinking about the humanitarian response right now. What are you hearing from country, country donors when you are saying, you know, we need this support now more than ever. We really need to be thinking about resilience as much as we're in a crisis moment. We need to be thinking about medium to long term. What are what are donor countries telling you right now? I think they are very aware of those nexus issues that we just talked about, that they're um, completely committed and really apprised of the challenges they're seeing in terms of the humanitarian side of things. But they're also recognizing for longer term solutions, they do need to try to, to find those areas where they can contribute on both sides. I mean, doing things that actually support both the humanitarian and can support the longer ter term is critical. I think part of the practical reality, too, is that governments have appropriations of funds and there may be climate funds out there right now that are already tagged and that, the, that they've been given the, the authority to spend those resources. They may not be that easy to put directly into something that's humanitarian, but the climate funds are where they tend to be contributing now to uh, units like GAF-SP, 
because we're firmly supporting and actually seem to be part of the solution on climate. I mean, agriculture hurts can hurt how it's done, but it can also heal the planet. Right. So that's also where it unlocks different sources of financing, which doesn't put us directly in contradiction with what, what's happening on the humanitarian side of things. The other piece that's critical that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is that GAFSP is also looking to unlock on the private sector side of things. Mm -hmm. As we heard from Earth in a few minutes ago, it's the risk that's the, the issue often. It's risk with um, the lowest income countries, but it's, right. also it's also agriculture that's risk. GAFSP is exploring and is working with the International Finance Corporation to introduce blended finance so that some form of grants can actually buy down the level of risks there so that it makes agriculture more attractive for commercial interests to be investing in. We're also looking to expand that to our other supervising entities so that they can also offer the same kind of support so that that can um, reach the untapped potentials that are there for private sector funding into the food system as well. Yeah, I think the the private sector piece really is so key. And as Arthur was, was mentioning, sometimes it's just hard to get the attention, right? It's you can jump up and down and wave your hands in the air, but um, you know, how do you really show them that it's worth the investment? Exactly, it has to be a worthwhile investment. And sometimes it's just a matter of seed funding going in to actually show and to overcome some of the notion of risk in agriculture, as well as the actual risk is there as well. So seed funding in terms of grants can actually start bringing partners together that can build sustainable and commercially financial um, deals or financing going forward. So that's that's part of the challenge, I think, that's there. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, the private sector has to be on board, right? They control too much of the food system for them not to be. So it's just, I mean, whether you like it or not, that's just a fact. So yeah, I think that that's such a good point. Um, Chase, coming back to the, the funding issue for WFP, and as you laid out at the beginning, just really alarming levels of funding. How does it feel to feel like, you know, the the organization essentially has to make its case that in such a crisis environment with reduced fiscal space because of COVID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, crisis on crisis on crisis. How do you make the argument that WFP is where the money should go? You know, that we are your best return on investment for these dollars. It's a great question. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not a robbing Peter to pay Paul situation. What we don't want here is that dollars from development efforts are diverted into humanitarian streams. What we need is more, frankly. I mean, we just need more. We need to be doing an order of magnitude more than we're doing right now. It's plain and simple. I mean, I, I don't, I'm kind of running out of oxygen. We're yelling from rooftops. We're doing whatever we can to get people to care about this and excited about this. But we just, uh, and we are making, we are making inroads. I promised uh, Teresa, that I would be optimistic about this. And I think that there are reasons to be, right? If you look at what's happening in Congress right now, well, well one step back first, right? We spent $5 trillion during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at that funding stream and how that money was spent, just three-tenths of 1% of that went to international causes. If you back it out even further, just three one-hundredths of a percent of that went to international food assistance. So we're not asking for a lot here, uh, given what has been spent in response to COVID-19. We're just asking that we can help put out these fires. Now, um, I think there are some really important things happening, right? So if you, you look back early in this year, in February of this year, a coalition of, of groups from WPUSA and others around the table in the room here today went up to Capitol Hill and went to the administration and said, hey, we need $3.8 billion in supplemental international funding. And that's going to at least help stop the bleeding for the 44 million people who were on that, on that verge of famine. Um, we didn't see that, but in the omnibus package, uh, there was some supplemental funding for Ukraine, not a lot, um, but enough. And some of that, some of that money is of course going to be used for other humanitarian purposes that isn't food assistance. So we really would like folks at aid and, and in Congress and other places to be advocating for as much of that to be spent on food assistance as we possibly can. The other place that we've had some luck um, and, and just a lot of really good advocacy work is around the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust. There is a sort of resource of last resort that exists at USAID and USDA that can be tapped in extraordinary times, and this is an extraordinary time. Um, I think we're close with that. Um, some leaders up on the Hill, especially Senator Moran, have, were, were really effective in, in leaning on the administration to see that money released. That ironically started out as a wheat trust back in the 80s, and Boy, is it ever needed in, in a, exactly the moment when wheat prices are rising yeah. pretty dramatically. 
So I think between the Ukraine SUP and between the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust, we're making some progress. Um, but it's just not there. We just need to do a little bit more. And again, I'm very grateful for everything that the U.S. government does, and 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 uh, USAID is is such a big partner of the World Food Program. Could not do even an ounce of the work that we do without the U.S. government. But we do now need people more than ever. I mean, I always talk about the relationship that the American people have with the World Food Program. Uh, this is an organization that was sort of built under Eisenhower. It was brought to fruition under Kennedy. It was it was Senator George McGovern who helped lay the foundation stone for the World Food Program. If ever there was an organization that U.S. lawmakers can see themselves contributing to the legacy of, it's the World Food Program. Um, and we don't want to do it all. We just want to be able to provide the humanitarian assistance and start transitioning towards those development efforts. So I think the ROI is good. Uh, I think lawmakers know that. It's just we got to get out of our own way to get the right amount of, of dollars to the problem. Yeah, I think that's a really great reminder of how important the U.S. is in, in financing food assistance and food systems around the world. I don't think anyone in this room probably needs a reminder about that. But, um, you know, the the Bill Elmerson Humanitarian Trust, they were talking about that up um, a hearing and, you know, USAID really, really making the case and having the relationship with USDA to, to really get that that money out the door. And it definitely sounds like folks on the Hill are. Uh, interested in making that happen as well, because um, as you said, there's really no argument that now is not the time for that. Um, Catherine, want to come back to you just with one minute, if you have um, perhaps a, a moment of optimism that you would like to share to, um, you know, as you're looking into your meeting this week, and you know, something positive that you, that you're hoping for as well. Um, something positive. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I guess what I find always very positive is um, we're excited because we're going to be hearing from farmers as well this week. They are going to be joining remotely for the meetings and the discussions we have with them, um, the kind of, of messages that they send in terms of what they do and, and what they're able to do and the kind of support they need, I think is always really encouraging. Um, my just previous job, I, I worked in India on the World Bank's program in India, a very large agriculture program. And it's amazing the resilience that you see in the people that are there on the ground and just their ability to look at opportunity and to turn it into action. The way that they do have strong communities that actually do come together. And, you know, that's one of the things that I most value about my new engagement with the, the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program is we, we have civil society that directly sits on the board. They're being able to actually have that direct link down and to to help empower and to recognize the fact that that farmers i think are the largest group of private sector actors in the world we tend to look at them unfortunately as recipients all the time but they are incredibly resourceful and incredibly able to find the solutions to really take care of the planet and to produce food so i'm all for unleashing that power and making sure that the, the money can go there and that they can they can be part of the solution that was certainly a moment of optimism. You did great there. <laughs> I'm feeling optimistic after that. Catherine Chase, thank you so much. <clears throat>